Hey guys, welcome back to our continuing coverage of the Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo here in Podcast Central. All the shows we're doing this weekend are going to be simulcast on the Chuckload of Comics YouTube channel and on the Chumpcast wherever podcasts can be found. Joining us here in the booth, a very, very special guest, author Mr. Joe Hill. Woo! Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to come to the booth. Hey, thanks for having me on. Well, this is an absolute treat. Oh, if you'll goodness. indulge me for just a second, I told you earlier, Shauna and I and all the people standing out <laughs> right here are just ravenous fans of yours. Um, several years ago, big shout out to Afterwards uh, Books. I was, I'm a big horror novelist fan. I was at Afterwards Book uh, right here in Chicago. Shout out to your local bookstores. And I couldn't figure out what I was going to read next. And so I Google searched top 10 horror novels and i think number <laughs> three on the list was your book heart-shaped box i picked it up it was on the shelves and i've been a fan ever since let's face it too it was probably a bunch of crap at one and two. Oh, I'm well sure. you know whatever was in the <laughs> spots above a couple know. of no names yeah, yeah hardly exactly. worth, really hardly worth your time but right. i mean i read the synopsis <laughs> I, I the book was on the shelves i picked it up i read the back i was like this this book is just speaking to me and i picked it up read it i've read all your novels since then of hey, course got you. into the comic book stuff um thanks so much i mean you're here f uh, with uh, dc and honestly last year you did something absolutely unprecedented with hill house comics i mean it's it's a it's a veritable basket full of horror <laughs> titles um what can you tell us about uh, hill house comics how it came to be how you managed to corral these amazing creators for this project that you're doing well, so Hill House was about two or three years coming along. It was a thing I started to talk about with uh, Mark Doyle, who was the senior editor at Vertigo at the time. And uh, I had this idea uh, to do Blumhouse for comic books. Oh, you know, I mean, I it. love Blumhouse Studios. Yeah. They put together such a great body of work. You know, it seems like every year Blumhouse has another couple intelligent, well-crafted, character-driven horror films, whether it's satirical stuff like Get Out, or, you know, traditional stuff like The Conjuring and Oculus. You know, every year they're back for more. And and I thought, wouldn't it be great to cut comics in for the action? You know, in on the action. So I wound up, uh, you know, I pitched this idea. Mark loved it. It took a little while to get the timing right and sure. to drag in the right, you know, to get the right creators to work on it. But uh, eventually I wound up writing two titles for it. And uh, we got the likes of, uh, you know, Mike Carey, Carmen Maria Machado, Kelly Jones, Laura Marks, uh, Peter Gross and Vince Locke, Donnie, the Greek artist Donnie. And, and you know, they've been knocking out of the park. They've been great. Oh, yeah. man. I mean, they're fantastic. And the Plunge just came out last week, which was awesome. Plunge was <laughs> phenomenal. They just keep coming and they keep on just getting, I'm not going to say better. Because yours was the first that came out, but I mean, <laughs> not, I'm not gonna say everyone's getting better than the last, but I mean, they're just the quality is just up there. None of them dip in quality. Well, so so the idea is the the what we wanted to do is first of all we wanted to have comics. I mean, it sounds a little cheesy, but we wanted to have comics with big fat elevator pitches. You know, where you can describe it in a sentence or two, and people go, "Wow, I gotta have some of that." Yeah. Um, you know, so. Um, so, and then the next thing was, can we do a comic that's, that's can we do stories that are enclosed t stories of terror and dread that have beginning, middles, and ends where readers are making a limited commitment. You know, they're saying, it's just six issues, I'm going to take a shot on this. And I also really like, for me, when I, you know, my drug of choice when it came to comic books in my teens and in my 20s was the first and really scariest stuff that Vertigo published. Yeah. So it was titles like, you know, Neil Gaiman, Sandman, and and Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. I love the Grant Morrison Arkham Asylum, which I'm convinced is a horror comic, yeah, not a superhero okay. <laughs> comic. You know, and so I really kind of wanted to recapture some of that, some of the some of the, you know, the no no holds barred, you know, willingness to be scary, um, and then combined with you know some characters we can root for, and and uh, you know, hopefully some interesting themes, you know, yeah. that we would tackle some yeah. interesting ideas. Really, I mean, and some amazing interest. I mean, Dollhouse Family is one of the ones that come to mind. That book is <laughs> incredible. It, it is all over the place in, in, in different storylines, but it all ties in beautifully. It's it's probably one of my favorites right up there with Basketful of Heads. 
Oh, well, thank you. So so that one is Mike Carey. Mike Carey, of course, is the genius behind uh, Lucifer. Um, he wrote uh, a novel called The Girls with All the Gifts that was made into, like, like a great, great zombie film. You know, oh. just when you thought there was nothing left to do with the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> right. you know, Mike Carey came up with a genius twist. Um, you know, and so it was sort of a no-brainer to ask him to come in and, and see what he could do uh, for the Hill House titles. And the Dollhouse family is like... Like chilly cerebral British horror, right? It is. Yeah. You know, like one of the great Hammer horror films. Uh, um, definitely, like you know, early Vertigo. It also, I also think a little bit of like there's a George C. Scott horror film called The Changeling that I love, and it's kind of like that too. Oh, um, nice. So, and I do love that it's that it's intricately plotted where you've got storylines taking place in two or three different timelines, and slowly they converge into a kind of yeah. shattering finale. Yeah, well, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, uh, so is there is there going to be a big future for uh, for Hill House Comics? I mean, is it... Well... You got a phase two in mind? Well, so... so um, There's definitely more brewing. Um, I You know, if... It, I, I don't think that we've announced a wave two, and um, so... And I can't announce a wave two or sure. I'd get in trouble. <laughs> so I have not announced a wave two on the podcast. Okay, well, okay. I mean... We're loving it, so like, yeah. just, keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing. And also the Sea Dogs stories at the end of each yeah. book. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, Sea Dogs is a it's, it's a running backup feature in all the Hill House titles, and mm-hmm. I'm writing that too, and it's about how we used werewolves to win the Revolutionary yes. War. Because Brilliant. Because obviously, I mean, like when you think about like the British Navy and military was the most powerful army, you know, most powerful military force in the world at that time and somehow a bunch of scrappy revolutionaries without really any weapons or gunpowder managed to thump them <laughs> right. like how did that happen yeah. and of course the answer the is werewolves. obviously werewolves a, a, yeah. a bunch of werewolves on the on the boat <laughs> yeah I love it just read your history books kids yeah. i mean <laughs> um I, I, I want to move on to a couple other things but also big shout out to dying is easy uh that oh, hey, book, thank you. That yeah, book that is phenomenal did you write all the jokes yourself or do you have I a comedian no no you? no i wrote all the jokes so dying is easy i'm doing with uh uh, um, uh, IDW, mm-hmm. and it's my first attempt to sort of write like a uh, a fair play mystery. A fair play mystery is is a mystery where the reader knows everything the detective knows, and if you're crafty enough, you can actually solve the mystery ahead of the detective. Okay, but if yeah. I do my job right, you don't. You know, yeah. so yeah. the ending comes as a surprise. The hero is a guy named Sid Holmes, who is a uh, he's a former homicide detective who left the force in disgrace mm-hmm. and returned to his his former first love, which was stand-up comedy. <laughs> so he's gone from being a failing cop to being a failing comedian. And uh, one night he winds up on the hook for another comedian's death, and he has to find <laughs> out who actually killed the guy. Yep. So I think we've got, like, I th- what? Uh, two two, two, two yeah, issues. Two out. Out. No, I think the third issue might have just dropped. Oh, oh this we, week? Right. we didn't get to pick up so our we, books we were this week because this. we were setting up. <laughs> I think the third issue just <laughs> dropped, week. and there's two more to go. Yeah, well, Perfect. that first issue is great. I mean, it's almost all stand-up comedy. It's all, yeah. all the panels. I'm like, did he write these jokes? Because these are quality, quality <laughs> jokes. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, Nosferatu. Season two is yeah. about to drop. How amazing is Ashley Cummings? She's so as incredible. An yeah. She's so incredible. So, so Nosferatu was my third novel. It's the story of a guy who's got a car that runs on human souls instead mm-hmm. of gasoline, <laughs> and he's a real bad dude. And there's a young woman with a supernatural gift who tries to stop him, Vic McQueen, and that's played by Ashley Cummings in the TV show, which is on AMC. Um, the bad guy, Charlie Manx, uh, with the, the Quentin, evil car. Oh man. Yeah, so Zachary, Zachary Quinto. Quinto Zachary Quinto. Awesome. We also have Jakara Smith playing Maggie yeah. Lee as a librarian with a sort of enchanted Scrabble bag. Um, a bag of Scrabble tiles. She can reach into it. It's bottomless. And she can answer unanswerable questions using the bag. Um, Creepy effect in the show. Which yeah, it's like, pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And Jakara is kind of a breakout star. She's never been in anything before. She's and and great, she completely yeah. dazzles in the show. So we're we're now I think uh, what maybe just a couple months away from from the first episode of season two, yeah. and I can say that season two runs harder, is scarier, is sort of more relentless. Um, you know, the last two episodes of season one ran really hard, yeah, and really put Ashley through the ringer, yeah. yeah. And season two is like that from the first episode on, oh, and great. never lets up. <laughs> great. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited for the the release. So are we? Yeah, huge, we. huge Nosferatu fans. I see you, Nosferatu fan right there. <laughs> um, I mean, I know you got to go, but I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Lock and Key. Obviously, just dropped on Netflix. 
What a long road it has been for you getting this series made. It's been through so many iterations. Can you walk us through the, the road of Lock and Key from book to, to screen? <laughs> yeah, so so the first issue of Lock and Key, I think I started writing Lock and Key in very early 2007 or even maybe late 2006. And it's been an ongoing series uh, that I've done with my soul brother, Gabriel Rodriguez, who's drawn every single panel of every single issue. And uh, it has been, it's true that it had this bumpy sort of road to getting to TV in the sense of there was a pilot for Fox that was never aired except at a couple comic conventions. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a pilot filmed by Andy Muccietti for Hulu that was never aired. Um, But, you know, I think from the outside that seems like, wow, what a tormented path it had to getting to TV. But, like, I think coming from the world of publishing, it it doesn't really seem that strange. I mean, Mm. I do a lot of drafts on a novel before I get it right. And so to me, I just look at the TV, the different iterations of the TV show is as different drafts, and each one was better than the one before. Oh, nice. and, I, and I'd like to say that we actually started pretty so- strong. The very first pilot directed by Mark Romano is phenomenal. Uh, it's great. We we've seen it. it. We've, we've, we've seen it. We've reviewed it. We've, we love it. Yeah. Like, I mean, it has, this, it has this very chilly Kubrick. Yeah. Very darker. I do think that each iteration of Lock and Key was better than the one before and that Carlton Cuse and Meredith Avril for Netflix finally cracked it. They nice. figured out how to how to correctly balance the horror, the wonder, and the family story. Um, there's a lot of... It's the, the, the Venn diagram of genres on Lock and Key is pretty complicated. There's mm-hmm. a lot of different... It's a family story. Yeah, it's a mystery. Absolutely. It's a horror story. It's a fantasy story. It's a high school coming of age story. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a lot of play to have in the air um, so it took a little while to figure out how to get it but I, I, I you know I think we did and I, I have to say that the family and the friends you know who who, who inhabit these roles Connor Jessup Jackson Scott uh, Amelia uh, uh, Patrice uh, Darby they're they're you know they delivered they you know came with their a game yeah, they were tremendous in the, in the parts and and behind the scenes are also this this kind of fizzy effervescent bunch that just <laughs> loves each other and feeds off each other's energy and I kind of think like you can't plan chemistry right and if and if the Netflix show works it has had a lot to do with unexpectedly powerful chemistry between those actors that's amazing and like you said that's hard to come by sometimes that doesn't yeah. that's it not either happens or can, it doesn't right exactly I mean my favorite movie is Jaws I watch Jaws <laughs> right. every single year and the reason Jaws is brilliant is because of the chemistry between each of those performers yeah. you know and and uh, it would have been a great movie if it didn't have that chem- chemistry but with it it's the greatest film ever made well I mean Gabriel Rodriguez has to be happy with the way they made the keys the keys in the show look exactly Exactly like the keys in the book. I mean, did did, did Gabriel have a, a, a role to play in that? He, he did. He did. So, and also there are a couple new keys yes. mm-hmm. that are in the TV show mm-hmm. that were not in the comic that we introduced to sort of, you know, add some new wrinkles. Gabe designed those keys as, as, oh, as well. Awesome. So he did the first pass at those. And the other thing is, is I've worked with a guy, uh, my friend Israel Skeleton runs Skeleton Crew Studios, mm-hmm. and they do a lot of merch, a lot of comic book based merch, mm-hmm. and they've created replica keys. Yes, mm-hmm. we've going, seen yeah, that. Yeah. Seen going back shops. to like 2010 or yep. something. Mm-hmm. Um, beautiful you know, beautiful looking items. And and Izzy for sure designed a couple of the keys for the show. So a couple of the, the on-screen keys you see are his. Oh, that's awesome. I don't think he did them all uh-huh. um, because the pace of making the show is so quickly, oh, you know, sure. it's such a furious pace that they have to be able to manufacture stuff sometimes within 24 hours. Wow. But I'm pretty sure he did a couple. Maybe the head key and... Yeah. Mm, and I'm not sure the what anywhere the other ones key were. maybe uh, maybe the anywhere I don't think no actually I don't think he did the, do the anywhere key but the, for sure he did the I think he did the head key yeah <laughs> a couple others I mean it's one of the most iconic ones that yeah. and the, that and the ghost key he might have done the ghost key too okay well nice. I mean last last little lock and key question I know you got to go but uh, I mean do you have a favorite part in the series that you looked at it and you were like they got it it's perfect yeah so uh, the third book in the lock and key series is called crown of shadows Mm -hmm. and in it the villain dodge wears a crown that allows her to bring shadows Mm -hmm. to monstrous life and like I think for every child the scariest thing in the world is the darkness under the beds under the bed and imagining that darkness leaping to life and watching the show and watching the shadows peel themselves off the walls Mm -hmm. and come for the lock family is is as good as I hoped it would be and then better yeah you know it was so is so viscerally frightening and satisfying and exciting so I love I love the whole show but I think especially the 
final two episodes with the shadows, shadows coming to life. It's funny mention that. Nails it. That was one of my favorite parts too. Yeah. Is when uh, Dodge is putting on the crown and you can see the reflection in the eyes. I'm like, that's right out of the book. There's yeah. a shot in the. There's a Rodriguez panel, or maybe it's even a cover. Where you can see the reflection in the eyes, it's like th- it looks exactly like it does on paper. Well, so there's also a key, the anywhere key, which you can use. You can stick it into a door and mm-hmm. open the door and step out through another door anywhere in the world. And there was this one panel in the comic where uh, Nina is coming through a door from one direction, and Dodge yes. is leave- using the anywhere key to leave through a door in the other direction, and they they cross. sort of impossibly, it's like this MC Escher thing uh-huh. where they impossibly sort of cross each other without seeing each other. And in it's Kinsey, it's not Nina, it's Kinsey in the show. But they recreated that shot, I you know, that. right from the <laughs> yeah. comic mm-hmm. in the show. And that's like, like I got goosebumps uh, just thinking uh, about it. Yeah, uh, that, that's a very cool. memorable scene. So, Joe, we really want to thank you for coming by, talking oh, about Hill House yeah. Comics. Obviously, Nosferatu comes out in a couple weeks. And Lock and Key, if you haven't checked out on Netflix, obviously do it. So, I have a question for you before I go. So, C2E2, what's the best cosplay you've seen so far? Uh, oh, my gosh. This year? Uh, probably the... the uh, the person in the stormtrooper outfit that is covered in rhinestones, top to bottom. Have you seen that? Part? Like oh, every wow. single inch of <laughs> inch of this of this suit is covered in tiny rhinestones. Oh my Gl- god! You've seen it. It's the most incredible thing. I saw a CBGB punk rock uh, Spider-Man, you know, nice. a little while ago yeah. with like the studded, with like the studded mask and everything, awesome. which is kind of cool. But let's be honest, do you really think that Peter Parker is like a punk rock fan? Because nah. I think he's more of a yacht rock, like Kenny Loggins kind of right? guy. Isn't yeah, he? no, I think he <laughs> listens just, just listens to the radio, classic rock, and just yeah. like what, whatever the radio feeds him. He I mean, when, to. when John Romita Jr. drew him, he, he, had, he was usually seen wearing bell bottom. Pants, right. Like, oh, that's right. Like, I kind of feel like he's a Bee Gees guy. There you go. I don't know. He puts on the black suit and starts putting on the Marilyn Manson. And, I mean, he's, <laughs> he listens, he's, a, he's a long, that's more extensive like catalog. That's true. <laughs> that's a good hey, guys, thanks for talking to me. It was great. Yeah, Are Joe, thanks a lot, guys. Thank We're just so getting much. warmed up here at C2E2. we got a lot more interviews, lots more shows, so stick around on YouTube all weekend long, and we'll see you guys around the con floor. Have a great week.